Princess of Wales was the people's princess. She was one of the most profound and beautiful people the world will ever know. Her loving kindness gave hope to the homeless, care to landmine victims, and a loving touch to AIDS patients. She was an inspiration to her children. She never once allowed her unfaltering love for us to go unspoken or undemonstrated. She was quite simply the best mother in the world. The evening is all about our, our mother. Uh, the main purpose is to celebrate and, and to have fun and to remember her in, in a fun way. She had a vision of a new style of monarchy that reached out and embraced people. I feel that she's still here today with us, even although she's no longer here with us in, in, in body, she'll always remain a part of our hearts. Her unprecedented royal popularity and charity work still influences the world today. Problems that it has with AIDS, it's obviously associated with all the countries that she's been to as well um, when she was around. Um, so it's just a chance to sort of carry on what she left behind, really. Her legacy lives on through the millions of hearts she touched all around the world. She was such a people's person at the end of the day. And um, so when she died, we, we, we lost such an icon. Um, and I think everybody felt as if they lost somebody that day. We can't imagine um, that she's forgotten. The people always tell sometimes she's forgotten. She's not forgotten. Princess Diana's charity work in many ways is her lasting legacy. She also lives on through her two sons, who have continued in her footsteps, giving substantial time to Diana's charities and to their own. Diana's positive influence on her children can still be seen today. From a very early age, His Royal Highness Prince William of Wales traveled around the world with his parents. Firstly, to Australia, where there was a great deal of interest about the possible future king from the students at the School of the Air. Does Prince William have a favorite toy? Um, Jamie, he loves his koala bear he's got. In 1985, William attended Mrs. Minor's nursery school, where his royal wave was just in its infancy. Ten years later, he enrolled at Eton College, one of England's most prestigious secondary schools. He was a serious student with excellent grades and also excelled in sports. His mother Diana encouraged William to live as normal a life as possible, such as a trip to Niagara Falls, complete with a souvenir baseball cap and family trips to the snowfields. Emotionally affected by the media's influence on his parents' divorce and his mother's tragic death, William has publicly stated his dislike for the press and seems uncomfortable with the growing attention he receives from love-struck adolescent girls. William gives the impression of being a well-mannered, responsible and mature young man who shows a strong sense of duty and loyalty to the royal family, fully aware of the role he is to play in the future as the King of England. William Wales. Upon his graduation from Eton, William took a break from his studies to visit South America and Africa. He then attended Scotland's St Andrews University, where he received a degree in geography in 2005. Following in the footsteps of his younger brother, Prince Harry, William joined the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst as a military cadet and received his commission as a second lieutenant. In 2008, he was appointed to be a Royal Knight Companion of the Most Noble Order of the Garter. He then began training to be a search and rescue pilot with the Royal Air Force. He was based with his brother Harry 
and spoke candidly about their life on the base. It's going very well, Rocket. It's, um, it's been, um, I've moved obviously off from the school because uh, now being a far superior RF pilot, I've now moved on to the Griffin. Mm. Um, and it's, uh, it's good fun. It, you now got more of a crew atmosphere, so I've got guys in the back, and it's really weird. You're flying along, and you get these random voices coming in your ear that you're not, you, you can't even see. And uh, your crew. you sort of respond. Yeah, exactly. Like, they're usually hanging off on a skid. Yeah, just yeah, random voices. Yeah. Uh, but no, it's good fun. It's, um, it's quite a long way to go yet before I'm finished, but um, I'm looking forward to you know, the few challenges ahead and, and flying. Along with his military career, William supports numerous charities. It's got a very nice community feel about it, I think. Okay. Everyone's been very nice and very welcome. He has taken over from his mother as patron of Centrepoint, the UK's leading homeless charity. He even slept out in the streets overnight to bring attention to the homeless issue. My brother and I were lucky enough to grow up supported by the love and nurturing of our family. They saw to our education, our health, our well-being, and every other need. His personal commitment to the cause was appreciated on the streets of London. His mum would be uh, proud of him, that's for sure. Having played his hand as a DJ, he enjoyed the moves of these asylum seekers and bonded with them like few royals could. So what's your favourite? What, what songs do you like? You've got the bandanas and everything for it, isn't it? Yeah. Sorted might not be the Queen's English, but his casual manner has won him a lot of fans, like his mother's common touch. Prince William became president of the Royal Marsden Hospital, another position previously held by Diana. He is patron of Mountain Rescue England and Wales, and is keen to highlight the courageous work of the volunteers. In 2009, Prince William and Prince Harry became joint patrons of the Henry Van Strobenzi Memorial Fund. I'd just like to say a few words uh, concerning why Harry and I wanted to get so involved with, uh, with charity. Harry and I were delighted when Alex uh, Claire, Tom and Charlie asked if we would consider uh, being patrons of Henry's charity. It was the easiest decision I've had to make. Having lost someone so close in similar circumstances, Harry and I understand how important it is to keep their memory alive. There is no finer way than that which Alex and Claire have chosen. This is the first charity of which we are both patrons, and it couldn't be a better one. As Henry was such a very close friend of ours, and because we believe so strongly in the need to alleviate poverty, and assist development in African countries, such as Uganda. The Prince has been a hit abroad as well, even in Australia, where there is community support for the Republican movement. In Sydney, he was warmly received by monarchists and screaming girls. William even demonstrated his talent with a machine gun in a live firing exercise showing that there is more to this prince than just good looks and a charming manner. He scored 103 millimetres, which is well and truly a pass mark in the infantry and the parrots. We can get anything under 150, so he shot pretty well. On his tour down under, he took the time to visit families whose homes and lives were devastated by bushfires. Even with the eyes of fast bowler Brett Lee on him, he held his nerve and swung the bat with conviction. At Government House in Melbourne, he joked of Prince Harry's affection for the country. There's that other guy with the ginger hair who just never ever stops banging on about you. And I haven't lived because I haven't been to Australia, blah, blah, blah. His trip to Australia was a wonderful success reviving interest in the monarchy, just as his mother did on her tours around the world. Due to his royal standing, William's personal life has been the subject of great media attention. He has been romantically linked to Kate Middleton. The paparazzi are hot on her heels. Like history repeating itself, the world wants to know who may be the next Princess of Wales.
Prince Harry is third in line to the English throne. And since birth, he's grown up in the media spotlight. Diana once described Prince Harry as a very artistic and sporty boy. Diana ensured that Harry enjoyed a normal childhood, despite his family's privileged position in British society. To this end, Prince Harry attended Mrs. Minor's nursery school in London's Notting Hill neighborhood. Photographers were on hand as his parents dropped Harry off for his first day. Big brother William was there to give him a hand. At an early age, he may have discovered his future career. Harry developed an interest in all things military. Despite his parents' increasingly strained marriage, he became known for his happy-go-lucky disposition as a child. In 1989, Prince Harry enrolled at the Weatherby School, where his older brother William was already a student. He then followed his brother to the Ludgrove School, a boarding school in Berkshire in 1992. After his parents' separation, Princes Harry and William spent their school holidays divided between their parents. Harry spent time at Highgrove with his father, as well as going on official trips and vacations abroad. With his mother, he engaged in a variety of activities, from going on tropical holidays to visiting AIDS clinics and homeless shelters. After his mother's death, Harry grew to be a typically rebellious teenager. On more than one occasion, he has attracted the attention of the tabloid press for drug use, reckless behavior at sporting events, and scuffles with the paparazzi. In January 2005, photographs were beamed around the world of Harry's attendance at a friend's party wearing a Nazi uniform. This outraged royal commentators. This one is a big one. Um, he should have realized that wearing a Nazi uniform as a member of the royal family is just not a starter. Harry later made a public apology for his poor choice of costume. He also got caught going to a strip club and the prince's reputation for hard drinking and frequent clubbing was again at the centre of public attention. He's got to have a life, you know, why shouldn't he experience the things that we experience just because he's got a name tag on him, you know? That's basically he's it, really. a young man trying to enjoy life, basically, isn't he? Just because he's been born into royalty, you know, he's still just a lad, isn't he, after all? He has not had a happy relationship with the media. I suppose that is the media in general. There's, there's truth and there's lies, and unfortunately I can't get the truth across because I don't have my own column in the paper, which I'm thinking about getting. After completing his A-levels, Prince Harry took a gap year, during which he visited Australia, Argentina and Africa, where he made a documentary about the plight of orphans in Lesotho. Um, but when it comes to kids, I just, I love kids. And it's something about African kids that are just even more special. Um, they're so underprivileged, yet, you know, anything you give them, any little present, whatever it is, um, they will be so appreciative about it. They'll think it's Christmas. Prince Harry entered the Royal Military Academy in Sandhurst in 2005. He successfully completed a 44-week training course as an officer cadet before being commissioned in 2006 as a second lieutenant in the household cavalry. The question will arise of, of you really seeing some military action and being on the front line. How do you feel about that? Um, I wouldn't have joined the army unless I thought I was going to. Um, simple as that. Um, if, if they said, no, you can't go front line, then I wouldn't, put, I wouldn't drag my sorry ass through Sandhurst, and I wouldn't 
I wouldn't be where I am now because the last thing I want to do is have my soldiers sent away to Iraq or wherever like that. And for me to be held back home, twiddling my thumbs, thinking, well, what about David? What about Derek? You know. The main concern about Prince Harry going out to Iraq is that he will become a target for insurgents, including Al Qaeda. Uh, their intelligence on the ground is is quite good, and they will be aware where his unit is deployed. Whatever the press uh, in Britain and elsewhere says or, or does not say. And one suspects that because of his symbolic value, they will attempt uh, to target this unit. Well, it's a double-edged sword. I, I think he should serve, but I think he has to show the people of his country that he's there to serve them. Well, I think he should go. If he's, if he's in the army, then he should do what other people in the army do. No special arrangements for a, a prince. Prince Harry completed more than two months' service with the British Army in Helmand Province, Afghanistan as a forward air controller for NATO forces. When the news was leaked of his presence on the war front, he was subsequently called home. In 2009, he began a two and a half year training course to become a fully operational Army Air Corps helicopter pilot. Um, it is, I've always had a love for helicopters. Um, I've always wanted to be a pilot mainly of helicopters more than fixed wing, even though I'm slightly under the impression that fixed wing is probably easier than helicopters, especially as these things aren't designed to fly. But um, I'm really enjoying it. And, you know, as, as everyone knows, it is my easiest way of getting back onto the front line. Um, and maybe safer, maybe not safer, I don't know. Um, but there's a bit of pressure from, from certain places, which I'm sure you're aware of, of the reasons why I'm allowed to go back. And if I do go back, then... Apparently, I can't do the same job as I had, so I'm looking somewhere different and more, more of a challenge to try and become a helicopter pilot. Was it made pretty clear to you after the last time in Afghanistan that it would be your first and last time, that it was too risky for you to go back as a, as a soldier? Uh, more the fact that I think the media had said that they would never keep their mouths shut um, if I went and did the same job, so I'd have to do something different if I wanted to go, yes. But you are hopeful, confident and, and passionate that you do get back by this means, that you get back to the front line? Massively so, unless they stop flying helicopters out in Afghanistan soon, which I hope that they won't do. But, you know, as I said, I love flying helicopters, or I'm loving flying helicopters at the moment. I just hope that I can be better than better than the best. You know, that's what I always strive to be, to be, you know, spot on. But, you know, as I said, to get out to Afghanistan again would be fantastic, and my best chance is to be a helicopter, is to do it from a helicopter. And you, so, you got so off I'm, the ground yet? Sorry? You got off the ground I yet? I just got off the ground, yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks for asking. During this period, Prince Harry co-founded the charity Centre Bali with Prince Seiso of Lesotho in memory of their mothers. Prince Seiso and I both lost our mothers when we were very young. We set up Centre Bali in their memory. And because my mother loved this city, it makes this occasion all the more poignant for me. This charity supports orphans and vulnerable children in Lesotho. Harry is also a skilled polo player and an avid rugby fan. He has been romantically linked in the past to Zimbabwean girlfriend Chelsea Davey. With rumours swirling in the media of an impending wedding, he is keen to keep his private life private. It does irritate me because obviously I get to see how upset she gets and I know the real her. Um, but that's something that we deal with on our own time. And unfortunately I can't turn around to the press, I can't turn around to people and say, listen, she's not like that, she's like this. Well, how, how is she? How would you describe her? Um, that is my private life and I don't really, I would, love to, I would love to talk to you about it. I'd love to tell everyone how amazing she is, but you know, it's, that is my private life and once I start talking about that, then I've left myself open and if anyone asks me in the future then they say, well, well hang on, you told them, but why aren't you telling us? Throughout his life, Harry's relationship with his big brother has held him in good stead. It's amazing how close we've, we've become, you know, I mean, ever since our mother died, obviously we were close. Um, but he is the one person on this earth who I can actually really, you know, we can talk about anything and we understand each other and we give each other support and everything's fine. Almost a decade after their mother's death, William and Harry teamed up to organise a memorial for Diana. Next year is the 10th anniversary of the loss of your mother. 
How are you planning to mark this? Um, next year we hope to uh, commemorate and celebrate um, our mother's life um, as it's been 10 years since she died uh, with a memorial service um, on August 31st um, in London uh, and then a, uh, a concert, uh, a tribute concert um, celebrating her life uh, on July the 1st on her birthday. Harry, who will be attending the church service? Um, the service is going to include uh, both sides of the family, our mother's side and our father's side, um, everyone getting together. It should be a good occasion and lots of loud hymns, I vow to see my country, all the, all the good ones. And um, no, it should be a very sort of simple and nice uh, service. The service was held at the Guards Chapel in the Wellington Barracks. 500 guests, including 30 members of the British royal family, attended along with political leaders, past and present. Pop stars, including Sir Elton John, were also in attendance. Prince William and Harry escorted their father and Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth into the chapel. William led the readings. I bow my knees before the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. When she was alive, we completely took for granted her unrivaled love of life, Laughter, fun and folly. She was our guardian, friend and protector. She never once allowed her unfaltering love for us to go unspoken or undemonstrated. She will always be remembered for her amazing public work. But behind the media glare, to us, just two loving children, she was quite simply the best mother in the world. Well, we both wanted to, to put our, um, our sort of stamp on it. We wanted to represent exactly what our mother would have wanted, um, how she was and, and all that sort of things. So therefore, the church service alone isn't enough. We wanted to have this big concert with, you know, full of energy, full of um, sort of fun and happiness, which I knew she would have wanted. And on her birthday as well, it's got to be the best birthday present she's ever had. And with it, we can, by the two of us um, organising it, um, we wanted to have the, uh, the fact that the evening is all about our, our mother. Uh, the main purpose is to celebrate and, and to have fun and to remember her in, in a fun way. We're really lucky that we've got the uh, Wembley Stadium and the arena, and uh, along with a whole other partners um, who are helping in, um, along in the whole event. Um, it should run really smoothly and um, they've given up so much of their time to help. And of course having Wembley itself is brilliant. We've decided that it's going to be called um, Concert for Diana. Um, because obviously the evening is going to be purely about her. Um, it's to remember her and to commemorate her life and celebrate it. We're raising money for um, uh, Centre Point and Centre Bali. Um, I'm patron of Centre Point and Harry's patron of Centre Bali. Um, and they're both charities that are, are continuing on from my mother's legacy. Money raised would also go to the Diana Memorial Fund and the main charities she supported. The idea is we wanted to get um, uh, artists that our mother really uh, loved um, and then um, artists that both Harry and I enjoy. Um, it, it's going to be different and it's, it's going to be interesting. If it works, it'll be brilliant. If it doesn't, then um, we won't be, we'll be in the country. You won't see us for a very long time. Yeah. The final billing of the artists and acts that donated their time included Sir Elton John, Andrew Lloyd Webber, Brian Ferry, Nelly Furtado, Duran Duran, Kanye West, P. Diddy, Roger Hodgson from Supertramp, the English National Ballet, Tom Jones, Joss Stone, and many more. It's, it really is, you know, from what we had in our heads, the, the idea, to now actually seeing it in reality, it's suddenly bringing it to life, and, you know, I don't know how excited Joss is about it. I'm very excited. The concept of the concert was well received by the English public and sold out in just 17 minutes. Absolutely. Absolutely. She appreciated music and I'm sure she had, uh, you know, it was something she would have appreciated. To pay, yeah. To pay yeah, I think yeah. definitely yeah. if that's what they want to do, you know, it's for their mum, so why not? There's lots definitely, of money yeah. for charity, so yeah, it's good.
Yeah, I think it's nice for the boys to remember their mum. More than 60,000 people joined Princes William and Harry at Wembley Stadium. Around 15 million people in the UK watched the concert for Diana on television. And it was broadcast to 140 countries around the world. The concert for Diana was a huge success. It was just yeah, everything was perfect. fantastic. Absolutely yeah. fantastic. I love the concert. I like the idea that they celebrated her birthday and her life, you know. I love Prince William and Prince Harry. The whole, the whole experience is quite an amazing thing, you know, it's celebrating a life that was pretty special to the world and I feel a part of that, so that's why I'm here. There was plenty of love at the backstage after party as well. It's quite an honour really to be asked to do something for, you know, the princes of England and for their mother, who was one of the most beautiful people in the world, I think, and is definitely seen that way by the world, not just by England. You know, this is everybody all over the world sees Princess Diana as probably the best princess we'll ever have. And the most beautiful energy, like she's kind of seen as an angel. It was really nice, yeah, I met um, Prince William and Prince Harry today and they were really, really lovely, really tall and <laughs> and very uh, sincere and, and, and Harry said he was most looking forward to my performance, which was really flattering. I think they both have my CD. Um, and I saw the clip of them singing along afterwards. That was really, really cool, so. I'm happy. I've had a fun time here. Tom Jones reflected on meeting Diana. She she was lovely. She was she was easy to talk to. Um, I did a Kurdish uh, concert, you know, for the Kurds, uh, refugees, you know, for the relief in Wembley, the Wembley Arena, and she was there. And uh, we we had a good uh, chat backstage. She was actually walking behind me when I was coming off the stage and I didn't know that she was that close to me. And I said, I'm bloody boiling, you know, hot. I wasn't looking around because I thought my son was behind me. She said, yes, I bet you are. And you, 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 I bet you want to put your head in a, in a bucket of ice now. I said, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I didn't know it was you. But then she was laughing. And so we went in the dressing room and, you know, we had a good chat and she told me how much she enjoyed the show. No doubt Princess Diana would have been proud of her two boys raising a great deal of funds and attention to the charities she cared about so dearly. Throughout Diana's life, she used her high profile to help over 100 charities all around the world. In 1995, Diana received the International Humanitarian of the Year Award from the United Cerebral Palsy Fund. This award recognized her work with children. The princess was most publicly noted for her charity work and stance against landmines. Photos of Diana walking through a minefield wearing a ballistic helmet and flak jacket brought a great deal of publicity to the issue. Perhaps her most inspiring work was when she became the first high-profile person to knowingly touch people with the HIV virus. HIV does not make people dangerous to know, so you can shake their hands and give them a hug. Heaven knows they need it. Drug and alcohol abuse was another of her main concerns, and she often spoke her mind about the subject. As far as prevention is concerned, parents and teachers are in the front line. As a parent myself, I'm only too aware of the responsibility this implies. In the last year of her life, she focused her attention onto six charities. Centerpoint Soho, the Leprosy Mission. Here again, she made the point of touching the children with the condition. The International Red Cross, the National AIDS Trust, the Great Ormond Street Hospital. This hospital provides training for children's specialists. Royal Marsden NHS Trust, dedicated to cancer treatment and research. The Diana Princess of Wales Memorial Fund was established after her death. Its mission is to continue her humanitarian work in the United Kingdom and overseas. It received donations from people shortly after her death. Uh, yeah, I've come to make donations to uh, my taking facility. 
Nothing kept driver. The public donations totaled about twenty million pounds and were warmly received by the beneficiaries. I think it um, is very welcome. Um, it's very important because um, many members of the public um, here at home and indeed overseas um, want to give something to the causes that the Princess of Wales was associated with. In addition to the public contributions, a further £80 million was generated through commercial activities, including a large donation from Sir Elton John, thanks to his recording of Candle in the Wind that he sang at her funeral. I'm astonished. I mean, this is, you know, a part of it. I mean, this, this is the interim payment. There is probably much more to come. Um, you know, the single sold so quickly um, uh, that we we're able to hand over the cheque now, part of it anyway. Usually when you make a record, you don't get the royalties for about a year and a half because, you know, the accountants have to put this one sold so quickly. So I am astonished. I'm extremely pleased. With the Memorial Fund still pursuing her humanitarian work, the everlasting legacy of Diana lives on and her loving influence on the world still remains. To truly appreciate the everlasting legacy of Diana, the Princess of Wales, one must consider the incredible life that she lived. Diana was the first British citizen to marry an heir to the throne in 300 years. She was, essentially, plucked from obscurity to become the future Queen of England. At only 19 years of age, Diana was thrust into the spotlight, held up as a public icon, living every childhood fantasy. But in reality, she was chastised by the media and stifled by the conservative royal family. Throughout her life, Diana's kindness towards others always prevailed. Since she was a child, Diana's radiant smile, her intuition and natural grace with other people, and her love of children shone through. As a result, she used her newfound fame to highlight many charity causes close to her heart and devoted her time to raising her two children, Princes William and Harry. In 1961, Diana was born into the aristocratic Spencer family. Her family had ties with the Windsors, and as a young girl, she enjoyed the company of Prince Charles's brothers, Andrew and Edward. At only six years of age, Diana endured the divorce of her parents, and later, when her father remarried, she found that she did not take well to her stepmother. Diana was sent to Riddlesworth Hall boarding school at eight years old, but she struggled with her schoolwork and homesickness. She later moved to West Heath in Kent, where she excelled in sports, particularly in the swimming pool, and was actively involved in charity work. Although Diana struggled academically, failing all of her O-levels, she was able to joke about it 10 years later when she revisited West Heath. My years at West Heath were certainly very happy ones indeed. I made many friends who I often see, and in spite of what Miss Rudge and my other teachers may have thought at the time, I did actually learn something. <laughs> so you would never have known by my O-level results. <laughs> Although exams, homework, and arithmetic may not have been Diana's strong point, at the age of 16, she attended finishing school in Switzerland, which perhaps helped with her excellent public speaking skills. Although Diana had by now inherited the title of Lady Diana Spencer, she was essentially a very ordinary young woman. She moved into a flat with friends in London and worked as a nanny and kindergarten teacher. This seemingly ordinary life, however, was all about to change. In 1980, at 18 years of age, Diana joined the royal family for a weekend hunt at Sandringham, invited by mutual friends. Diana's flatmates joked that perhaps she would become the Queen of England, but Diana modestly brushed them off. A string of requests from Charles followed over the next six months. The monarchy reportedly also considered Princess Astrus of Luxembourg as a suitable match for Charles, even though she was Catholic. 
but the tabloids pursued Diana as the main romantic interest of Charles. Her flat was under constant surveillance by the paparazzi, and she was followed wherever she went. Although the shy 19-year-old was suddenly thrust into the media spotlight, she still cared for all those who came into contact with her, even worrying about nosy paparazzi bumping into lampposts. How well are you coping with all the press attention? Well, as you can, you can see, you can tell. <laughs> are, you, are you bearing up with it quite well, though? Because it must be quite a strain with all of us after you. Well, it is, naturally. And you're, you're coping with it all right, though. It seems to be doing very well. Well, I'm still ran. <laughs> Can it, is there any possibility of any announcement of your marriage in the near future? Can you tell me? Can you tell me uh, if there's any possibility? I'm not going to say anything, please. Right, but oh, Prince sorry. Charles did give us a hint himself. He said we wouldn't have to wait too long. <laughs> in February 1981, the wait was over. Buckingham Palace announced that Prince Charles and Lady Diana were engaged. Diana, who was not yet 20 years old, was infatuated by her new fiancé. She stated that as long as he was by her side, she could do anything. Yesterday you were a, a nanny looking after children. Um, now you're about to uh, marry the Prince of Wales and, and one day you would, all, in all likelihood, be queen. It's a tremendous change for someone, if I may say, of 19 to make all of a sudden, the transition. It is, but I've had a small run out to it all in the last six months. <laughs> and next to Prince Charles, I know I can't go wrong. He's there with me. Upon collecting Diana from her shared flat in London, her new bodyguard had told Diana to enjoy these last precious moments of freedom, as she would never have this peace again. Diana did not know then how right he was. Diana was sent to Balmoral where she was groomed for the royal court. Her natural intuition with people quickly won her huge popularity with the crowds. And she especially enjoyed engaging with children. On July 29, 1981, the wedding of the century had finally arrived. People took to the streets in celebration as this day had been declared a public holiday. Although Lady Diana's father, Earl Spencer, was recovering from a stroke, he could no more miss his daughter's wedding than any of the millions of people tuned into television sets around the world. May I say a word? Yes. Um, the Spencers have, through the centuries, fought for their king and country. Today, Diana is vying to help her country for the rest of her life. Lady Diana's mother, Mrs. Shand Kidd, had flown from her home in Australia to attend the ceremony. At Buckingham Palace, the Queen and Prince Philip set off in the procession bound for St. Paul's Cathedral. While Prince Charles was accompanied by his brother, Andrew. Lady Diana, at 20 years old, emerged from Clarence House, ready to become the future Queen of England. Diana's silk wedding dress has since become an iconic moment in fashion history. Set against the drama of St. Paul's Cathedral and the British monarchy, Diana's ivory silk dress was suitably breathtaking, perfectly befitting a princess. Designed by David and Elizabeth Emmanuel, it featured a 25-foot train, 10,000 small pearls, elegant lace and sequin detail, and those iconic puffed sleeves. However, the designers hadn't considered the glass carriage Diana would travel in, and when she arrived at St. Paul's Cathedral, her 9,000-pound dress was crumpled. The royal couple honeymooned on a yacht from Gibraltar. But perhaps as a taste of what was to come, the princess wasn't entirely satisfied. Engaged on official duties and bound to a husband who had brought his fishing gear and books along to his honeymoon, the princess's fairy tale wedding did not necessarily translate into a fairy tale honeymoon. Madam, how are you enjoying married life? How are you recommending? 
In Cardiff, Princess Diana was given the freedom of the city. Her speech to the gathered dignitaries endeared her to the public and gave the monarchy confidence in their chosen princess. I am extremely grateful to you, Lord Mayor, and the City Council, and the City of Cardiff, for granting me the freedom of the city. I realize it is a very great honor, and I am most grateful. I would like to try to express my thanks to you in Welsh, also. My blessing is Carl Dode e Gumri, Hoffum so eto un via, dioch un vau. This tour, and particularly this evening in Cardiff, were the first big public tests for the princess. She passed with flying colors. She endeared herself to the people by speaking their language, and her youthful naturalness and humility contrasted greatly with the normal measured manner of other royals. On the 21st of June, 1982, Diana fulfilled one of her most important princess duties, she gave birth to Prince William Arthur Philip Louis. However, Diana later stated that she had had a difficult pregnancy and afterwards suffered postnatal depression. Although she later attributed it to simply needing rest, the princess spoke of waking up in the mornings and not wanting to get out of bed. In public, however, the royal couple still appeared happy. They soon conceived a second child and on the 15th of September, 1984, Prince Henry Charles Albert David arrived a week earlier than expected. Diana had endured a nine hour labor during which she refused to take drugs and sucked on an ice cube to prevent dehydration during the delivery. As Diana regained her svelte figure and returned to her duties, it became apparent that the media was no longer shouting for Charles's attention they wanted Diana, her smile, her glamorous outfits, and her charisma. I haven't yet worked out a method of splitting my wife in half. <laughs> she can do best side. Charles' jokes hit a rift between the pair. Charles and the monarchy had grown critical of Diana, of her choices in clothing, and her decisions to support various charities, and how to properly raise her sons. The one thing Diana could control was her body, and she turned to bulimia nervosa. During a tour of Canada, she fainted in public, adding to the list of things that a future queen simply must not do. Diana's charity work endeared her to the public, but to the royal family, Diana was going over the top with her work and raising issues such as AIDS and homelessness that the typically aloof Windsors would prefer not to discuss. She remained patron of Turning Point and helped to boost the morale of soldiers serving in Northern Ireland. She also lent her support to the wives and girlfriends of soldiers serving in the Gulf War and Kuwait. Diana's fun, frivolous nature was also frowned upon by the royal family, but endeared her to the public. At Prince Harry's Weatherby School Sports Day, she cast aside the traditional role of aloof princess to take part in the mother's race. When the cameras caught her larking with the Duchess of York on the ski slopes, Prince Charles was clearly unimpressed. He had been educated in keeping the mystique of monarchy intact. This did not come naturally to Diana. After months apart, the couple reunited when they visited Welsh flood victims. But after a few hours, Charles returned to Scotland, leaving Diana alone once more. There was great speculation that the marriage was on thin ice. Prince Charles was absent for Diana's 30th birthday celebrations in 1991, and royal watchers grew more concerned about the marriage. Soon after, the princess's father died after a long battle with illness, and Andrew Morton published a book that claimed there were problems within the marriage and that the princess had tried to commit suicide. The once vibrant princess began to publicly show the effects of her private turmoil. By now, it was glaringly apparent that Diana, with all her vigor, enthusiasm and kindness, was a bad match for the repressed royal family. 
Her sad demeanor was prevalent throughout the couple's tour of Korea late in 1992. It's thought that it was then that the couple decided to separate. Back home, at an eating disorder conference, she publicly spoke of her own battle with bulimia. Ladies and gentlemen, I have it on very good authority that the quest for perfection our society demands can leave the individual gasping for breath at every turn. This pressure inevitably extends into the way we look. Eating disorders, whether it be anorexia or bulimia, show how an individual can turn the nourishment of the body into a painful attack on themselves. And they have, at their core, a far deeper problem than mere vanity. After making her problem with bulimia public, the press continued to pry into her private life. Finally, the princess took the dramatic step of publicly asking to be left to live a more private life. In the process, removing herself from that which she loved, her charity work. But I was not aware of how overwhelming that attention would become, nor the extent to which it would affect both my public duties and my personal life in a manner that's been hard to bear. My first priority will continue to be our children, William and Harry, who deserve as much love and care and attention as I am able to give, as well as a, an appreciation of the tradition into which they were born. In a sad, ironic twist of fate, it was Diana's very attempt to escape the press which ultimately led to her death. Diana had embarked on a holiday with Dodi El Fayed, whom her brother would later claim was responsible for finally bringing happiness to the isolated princess. The paparazzi stalked the glamorous couple until that fatal night in August 1997, when Diana's driver desperately attempted to escape swarming, stalking photographers. At 3.57 a.m. on August 31, 1997, at La Petite Salpetrier Hospital in Paris, Lady Diana Frances Spencer, the Princess of Wales, was pronounced dead. Diana's driver, along with Dodi El Fayed, had died at the scene of the accident. Her bodyguard survived in a critical condition. Words could not express the shock and grief felt by the world. People who had only ever seen pictures of Diana in a magazine, watched her on television, or read about her in books and newspapers, felt as though they had lost a true friend. Over one million bunches of flowers were laid at Kensington Palace. Six million people lined the streets to pay their respects to her funeral casket. 2.5 billion people watched the procession on television. But for all those people who had never even met Diana, there were two boys who had lost someone who meant more to them than we could ever imagine. Diana's sons, Princes William and Harry, aged only 15 and 12, trailed behind their mother's coffin. In a eulogy given by Diana's brother, Charles Spencer asked the crowd to pledge that they would protect William and Harry from a similar fate and that they would continue to raise the boys in the imaginative, free, and joyful way Diana had begun. Diana's body was finally laid to rest, not in any royal grounds, but at her family's country estate, perhaps where she had always belonged. Although Diana had been laid to rest, the questions surrounding her death could not. The public, and the media had their own speculations as to what really happened in the Pont de la Alma Road tunnel. Mohammed El Fayed claimed there had been a murder plot against Diana and his son. I believe that my son and Prince Diana have been murdered by the royal family. Okay. 
An inquest lasting over 90 days with 270 witnesses and at a cost of 10 million pounds found that Diana died due to gross negligence of driver Henri Paul, who had been found with blood alcohol levels equivalent to drinking eight whiskies and traces of drugs in his bloodstream. Her death was also attributed to the stalking paparazzi. After the judgment, Prime Minister Gordon Brown, echoing sentiments of the royal family, demanded that speculation must finally be laid to rest. I think it's time to draw a line. I think the princes uh, William and Harry have spoken for the whole country when they say this is time to bring uh, this to an end. With that, there was an official end to the Diana inquest, but there was no end to the legacy of charity, goodwill and hope that she left the world. Nobody could more truthfully convey the magnitude of what Diana meant to the world than her brother Charles in his eulogy to a sister taken too soon from the world. He said, all over the world, she was the symbol of selfless humanity, someone with a natural nobility who was classless and who proved that she needed no royal title to continue to generate her particular brand of magic. We will all feel cheated always that you were taken from us so young and yet we must learn to be grateful that you came at all.